Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Vishna zaborski Breton, and I'm the Director of Communications with the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. The CPRA is a national organization that's dedicated to realizing the full potential of parks and recreation as a major contributor to community health and vibrancy. Membership in CPRA includes the 13 provincial and territorial parks and recreation associations and their extensive networks of service providers in over 90% of Canadian communities. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Supporting Wellness in Recreation Through Healthy Food Environments. There's been a great deal of interest in today's topic, and as such, we're expecting a full house of participants from across Canada. CPRA has hosted webinars over the years which provide tools, resources, and best practices for parks and recreation practitioners in Canada. Topics have included the Framework for Recreation in Canada, the CPRA Professional Development Certification, National Health and Fitness Day, and Connecting to Nature. For a full listing of our past webinars and to learn about upcoming presentations, I encourage you to visit our website, www.cpra.ca, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, today's webinar is going to be recorded, and uh, the link will be posted on the CPRA website for future reference. So if you have colleagues or friends who were unable to attend today's session, they can access and view the recording at their leisure. We will be sending a notice to all who have registered um, and posting to social media as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items before we get going. Um, there will be some opportunities for you to participate in the discussion during the presentation with polls that will be popping up on your screen. And following uh, the presentation, we'll have some time for questions and answers. You'll find a chat box at the side um, of your screen. Some, have, some participants have already found that. And feel free to type a greeting and a question, and the presenters will happen, have an opportunity to um, answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll also have a few evaluation questions that we look forward to hearing your, um, your views on at the end. I'd like to um, thank the Leisure Information Network for providing us with the technical support on today's webinar. And should, um, should you need any assistance, uh, Chris McCreary is on the line with us today. So thanks, Chris, for all your help. And at this point, I'd like to welcome our presenters today. We have with us today Lisa McLaughlin, who is the Program Manager with the Alberta Recreation and Parks Association uh, Communities Choose Well Program. Kayla Atke, who is a policy analyst with Alberta Policy Coalition for Chronic Disease Prevention um, and CLASP, the CLASP team. And we have Ashley Hughes, who is a registered dietitian, and she's also the project assistant for the Alberta Policy Coalition for Chronic Disease Prevention, and a research assistant for PowerUp, which is the Policy Opportunity Windows Enhancing Research Uptake in Practice. Um, and they are with the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. So with that, um, we have a, a wonderful presentation today, and I, I do thank Lisa, Kayla, and Ashley for their time. Um, and with that, I would like to turn things over to the ladies. Thank you very much for joining us today. Great. Thanks so much, Vishna, for having us. Uh, we're very, very happy to be here. This is Lisa speaking. Um, so I'm just going to, before we dive into the, the, the presentation today, I'm just going to start with um, a, just a quick brief overview of ARPA, the Alberta Recreation and Parks Association. Just so for anyone that's not familiar with our organization, we are a not-for-profit charitable organization based in Alberta with over 1,100 members both within our province and beyond. And our mission is to enhance the quality of life of all Albertans by collaborating with our members and partners to build healthy city, citizens, communities, and environments. And we offer many programs, services, and professional development opportunities for members and for communities across Alberta. So Kayla, did you want to just give a brief um, introduction to the Policy Coalition and Power Up?
Sorry, Lisa. Uh, Kila stepped out momentarily. Um, I can speak briefly uh, to my role. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so this is Ashley Hughes here. And my role with the Alberta Policy Coalition is primarily focusing on a recreational facilities project called FAIR, which we'll speak to later in the presentation, as well as assisting with the Power Up team around Alberta's Nutrition Report Card for children and youth. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Ashley. So to start our presentation, um, I'll just let you know what we're planning to talk about today. So we're going to talk, first of all, a bit about the link between recreation and wellness which um, hopefully will not be surprising to anyone. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about food environment. So what, what exactly do we mean when we talk about food environment and some different things to consider um, on that topic. And then the bulk of our presentation is going to focus on um, the story of changing food environments in recreation facilities here in Alberta. So we're going to talk a bit about key factors that have contributed to uh, moving this work forward here in our province. And then finally, we'll share some tools and resources that hopefully you can use to help you advance your work in this area um, in your own um, province. So before we get started, we're, we're very curious to know who is in the room. So um, Chris has come up with a couple polls for us. So if you want to just take a moment to let us know what your role is in your, um, you know, in your community um, and what sector you are um, affiliated with primarily. So it looks like we have primarily practitioners, a few policymakers, and a few researchers, which is great. And lots of people from the health sector. That's fantastic. Great, a few recreation. All right, great. Well, thanks very much, Chris. That's wonderful. So the next poll, too, is we're, we're curious. When you think about the topic of making your food environments in your facilities, your recreation facilities, healthier, which stage of change best describes your facility or community? So if you want to choose this to let us know where are you at in your own facility or community regarding um, implementing changes to support a healthier food environment. And there are five options here. Great. So it looks like we have a few people that are um, that have made changes, but it sounds like the bulk of people are either thinking about it or in the planning phase. So that's that's really great. So hopefully we'll be able to give you some um, some tips and tools and some resources that you can use to um, keep that work going and moving forward. Wonderful. All right. So to start our presentation today, it's important to understand what recreation has to do with wellness and healthy eating. Recreation centers are often the hubs of communities where people spend a lot of their time. People of all ages come to recreation centers to engage in sport and physical activity, artistic or cultural activities, and, and just to socialize. For some people, they might spend just as much time at their local recreation center as they do at their own home. Recreation centers also serve large numbers of children and youth, which provides an important opportunity to support their health and reinforce the healthy living messages they are receiving in school through health and physical education and comprehensive school health initiatives, or you may have also heard the term health promoting school initiatives. So all in all, recreation facilities are an important resource for community health. Now hopefully many of you have seen this uh, wonderful document, the Framework for Recreation in Canada 2015, Pathways to Wellbeing. And, and this document really exemplifies that wellness really is the business of recreation. So the development of this framework was co-led by the provincial and territorial governments, except for Quebec, um, CPRA, and the provincial territorial parks and recreation associations, including Quebec. And it's the result of a comprehensive consultation process that actually began um, here in Alberta back in 2011 at the National Recreation Summit. The framework really demonstrates that recreation has wellness at its core and is an important partner in addressing challenges and troubling issues in today's society. 
such as increases in sedentary living and obesity, um, uh, decreased decrease contact with nature, and inequities that limit recreation opportunities for some population groups. So the framework identifies five goal areas and priorities for action for each goal, including the obvious goal of providing opportunities to get people moving more during their leisure time. However, the framework also identifies the importance of the physical and social environment and the need to help people adopt healthy lifestyles by making healthy choices easy choices. So this goal has implications beyond physical activity. Promoting active living is important, but healthy food environments should exist in settings that promote physical activity participation to teach young people that it requires both healthy eating and activity to create a healthy body and mind and to encourage adults to be positive role models. If there's an abundance of unhealthy food and beverages in recreation center concessions and vending machines, prominent advertising of unhealthy food and beverages, a lack of healthy options, and a culture that really promotes the consumption of unhealthy foods and beverages within recreation and sporting settings and events. It's not easy for people to make a healthy choice, even if they want to. So we're going to talk now about food environments. And the term food environment is becoming more common lately. Food and food advertising are all around us every day, in our homes, neighborhoods, and in many buildings and spaces in our communities, like workplaces, schools, recreation centers, restaurants, supermarkets, convenience stores, and the list goes on and on. The term food, envi food environment reflects the idea that healthy eating is more than an individual choice and may be influenced by the environments in which we live. For example, the community nutrition environment, which is defined as the number, type, location, and accessibility of food stores, um, can influence individuals' food choices for better or worse. Living in a community with predominantly unhealthy food stores, for example, has been found to increase consumption of unhealthy foods because these items are more accessible and heavily promoted. So you can think about the food environment on a macro scale, such as an entire province, region, or a community, or on a micro level within a specific setting like a school, a workplace, or a recreation center. Within recreation centers, there are many areas where food may be available and where policy and programs may have an impact. This framework from BC's Stay Active, Eat Healthy program can help you to identify areas to focus on when working towards making healthy changes to foods and beverages available in your facilities or your community. The framework also depicts, importantly, how recreation facilities are not only a place of recreation, but they are also a place of work. Not only can staff wellness be supported by offering healthy choices at meetings and training events and in workspaces, but issues such as the marketing of healthy food choices, its availability in vending machines or food services, and even food initiatives happening in and around recreation centers, whether it's community gardens or good food box programs, those also impact staff. So what's the fuss about food environments in recreation facilities? Well, not surprisingly, research has confirmed that, indeed, food environments in recreation facilities are obesogenic, meaning they are generally energy dense and nutrient poor. And this is a problem because currently approximately one third of Canadian children and youth are overweight or obese. And they tend to remain overweight as adults. They're, they're much more likely to become overweight adults. And this is concerning because it puts them at an increased risk for a range of preventable health problems like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, joint problems, and mental health issues. As well, Canadian children and youth are not meeting Canada's food guide recommendations for a healthy diet, and teenage youth are consuming a quarter of their total daily calories from other foods, many of which are high in sugar and fat. So foods like burgers, fries, ice cream pop, chocolate bars, and other junk foods are becoming the norm rather than just a treat. What's also ironic is that while youth involved in sports are more active and do consume more fruits, vegetables, and milk than those who don't participate in sport, they are also more likely to eat fast food and snacks high in sugar, fat, and salt, to drink sugar-sweetened beverages, and consume more calories than, their, than those youth who are not participating in sports. So that does not seem to add up and make much sense. It's not enough to promote healthy habits in school 
schools because kids spend 80% of their waking hours throughout the year outside of school. This means that community settings like recreation centers are critical places in which to reinforce healthy living messages and influence children's healthy weights. So now I'm going to let Dr. Kim Rain, a researcher at the University of Alberta School of Public Health, explain a little bit more why it's time to change food environments in recreation settings. Hi, I'm Dr. Kim Rain. I'm a registered dietitian and a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. My research focuses um, on how food environments shape people's eating habits. Have you ever thought about the food served at school sporting events and recreation facilities? Sugary drinks, fried, salty snacks, it's all crap. Research shows that youth who participate in sports consume more fast food and more sugary drinks than you who don't. You can, um, we need environments that support video, healthy eating and better um, ways to fuel our participants for athletic performance and health. Computer, computer, After all, um, eating right can also improve attention, focus, and academic performance. Our environments impact our behavior. Schools, community sporting events, and recreation centers have the opportunity to enable healthy decisions rather than unhealthy ones. To see this change, we need to lead the change. No one can do it alone. Have you noticed that some facilities, sports teams and schools are sponsored by unhealthy food vendors or rely on junk food for fundraising opportunities? These partnerships exist primarily to generate revenue. Facilities, schools and teams have become addicted to these sponsorships and fundraising opportunities. We need to break free of this traditional, unhealthy model. Energy-dense and nutrient-poor foods are highly profitable, and it's our health that suffers. Using companies that don't promote health is counterproductive. Instead, we should be working with vendors to offer healthier products. Doesn't that make sense? Instead of these unhealthy partnerships, schools and facilities can secure additional funding through leasing and budget adjustments. Schools and teams can host healthy fundraisers by selling local produce, calendars, coupons, or gift cards. These changes won't be easy, but will help support the health of students and athletes. To get there, we need to work together to give our environment a makeover. We all play a role. Schools, recreation, and community facilities need to make healthy options more visible, accessible, and attractively packaged and priced. Ditch the deep fryer and drop the pop. Use creative promotions and clever marketing ideas for healthy options. Use whole grains and other healthy recipe substitutions. Add vegetables and offer salad instead of fries. Together, we can celebrate sport and participants with environments that support their health and performance. Let's make the healthy choice the easy choice. After all, it wasn't that long ago that smoking was banned at sporting events. Let's take it to the next level and continue improving these environments. Let's lead this change together. We can do it. Parents, teachers, and community members need to demand healthy options. As facility managers, coaches, and host committees, we need to make the difference. Guidelines and resources exist. Let's use them. Check out our online toolkit for support. Try it and share your story. Great. So this video was developed by Ever Active Schools, which is a provincial organization really leading comprehensive school health initiatives here in Alberta. Um, and it was also developed in collaboration with the Alberta Schools Athletic Association, who are supporting healthy changes in the food sold and served at Alberta school sporting events. It's part of a campaign that encourages individuals to pause and think differently about accompanying unhealthy food with school and community events where healthy habits are the focus.
All right, so we've given you a few tidbits so far about what is happening in Alberta to advance discussion and efforts to improve nutrition in recreation settings. Now we're going to tell you a bit more about what's going on. So a number of factors have contributed to the momentum building in Alberta over the last few years around the issue of food environments. We're not going to talk about comprehensive school health or school nutrition initiatives, but we will um, discuss the other elements in more detail. So what really got the ball rolling in many ways was the announcement of more than $30 million in funding in 2006 for several initiatives to support the health of children and youth. And this included the development of nutrition guidelines to help organizations and facilities offer healthy food choices. These voluntary guidelines were released in 2008 and outlined opportunities for schools, recreation, and child care centers to create healthy food environments. And Alberta was the first province to develop such guidelines. The guidelines divide food into three categories, including choose most often, choose sometimes, and choose least often. There's been significant progress to improve the school nutrition environment as a result of government investments and the work of many players such as health promotion staff, dietitians, and organizations such as Everactive Schools to facilitate comprehensive school health. So as a result of this, the focus is now beginning a shift towards recreation centers, which have not received the kind of financial investment for health that schools have. So the, the focus now is really starting to look at this is the next setting to really be promoting healthy eating. As many provincial organizations began to address food environments in recreation settings, I formed a collaborative group in 2013 to provide an opportunity for sharing and communication as well as collaboration rather than competition and duplication. Over time, the name of the group has become CHEERS, the Collaborative for Healthy Eating Environments in Recreation and Sport. And here on the, on the screen is just some of the, group, the members um, that are involved in this group. This has resulted in strength in relationships, communication, and collaboration, such as involvement in each other's initiatives, collaborative presentations like this one, um, and even exploring joint projects together. And I wanted to mention this group at this particular point in the presentation because a lot of the initiatives that we'll be highlighting have been carried out um, by one or several members of this CHEERS group. Another major component of the movement in Alberta has been grassroots action in communities led by local champions. So two particular ones of note are the City of St. Albert and Southland Leisure Center here in the City of Calgary. In St. Albert, this was the business and marketing manager in the Recreation and Parks Department. In Calgary, this was led by the concession and pro shop supervisor. Changes in, changes in St. Albert began with vending machines in one of their large recreation facilities when the contract came up for review. They used the, 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 rec, uh, the um, RFP, the Request for Proposals Process, to identify a vendor willing to provide healthy options. They started out with aiming for 20% choose most often and 80% choose sometimes, so no choose least often options, and they never looked back. They framed they frame the change as a commitment from the city to improve the well-being of its citizens, and they use media attention to raise awareness locally of the initiative. Subsequently, the city privatized its concessions and spoke with several potential bidders before the RFP process began to ensure interest in a contract that includes requirements for healthy choices and to stimulate competition between bidders. They received several RFPs and have taken a variable approach to food service requirements for concessions depending on the location of the facility. Those located near schools have higher requirements for healthy choices than others. Overall, the city has taken a choice-based approach to improving its recreation facility food environments. At Southland Leisure Center in Calgary, change really began with the development of a convincing business case by the concession supervisor to remove the deep fryers and replace it with a high-capacity oven, allowing staff to prepare popular concession items like french fries and chicken strips in a healthier way. Since then, she's engaged youth in facility-based after-school programs in taste testing and trialing new healthy menu items, and has worked closely with her vending machine supplier, Coca-Cola, to offer more healthy choices within the existing contracts. Coca-Cola has also funded new digital menu boards, and she's using these to promote healthy items on her menu and provide information about healthy eating. So just overall, a few lessons from these two examples. Um, are to you know, really assess your context and tailor your approach. So one size doesn't fit all. 
using the ability to use RFPs and contracts as tools for change. Um, as well, it's really important to engage your food service providers um, and your, con you know, your those that you're working with through contracts, um, you know, early on in the process to let them know about the direction that you're trying to go and really pursue it as a collaborative um, pursuit rather than, um, you know, something that. Um, that they feel threatened by. So really engaging them in the, in the process from the beginning. Um, also, that real opportunity that exists to use the media um, to your advantage to help promote the initiative and raise awareness of the changes and the reason for the changes. Um, the other big piece is these two people have been very skilled at, at um, developing successful and convincing business cases. And so really, the, you know, there's a real opportunity here to really sit down and assess the real risk involved in these initiatives, which actually um, is quite minimal when you break it down financially. Also, there are many different alternative sources of revenue, which is a major concern for recreation facilities. Um, but there are a lot of ways of um, getting around that. And we can certainly share more information about this with those who would like that information. As well, don't be afraid to ask council to subsidize revenue shortfalls and make that investment in a healthy community. And finally, when you're developing a business case, it's very important to consider who is going to be reading it. Um, and so the example with Jenna in, um, in, in Calgary, she actually developed four different business cases depending on who is going to be reading it so that she could appeal to the interests um, of those different people. Another great example of grassroots action on the part of a food service provider is Moo's Healthy Food Fast in the city of Edmonton, initially at one, um, one facility and now expanding into other facilities. They decided to build their business around healthy choices and have been successful. And so a few tips for Moo's is that, yes, you can be profitable based on, be basing your business around healthy food, but to stick to the basics. So you know, be, making sure to be attentive of portion control, don't have a deep fryer, and really figure out what, why people are eating and serve foods that will meet those needs. Another suggestion is to fill a niche. So really look at how can your business, um, your food service business, become a destination for people to obtain that food. So maybe there's, no, there's not really a good place to go to get a smoothie in your community or in that neighborhood. Can, can that business really fulfill that need? As well, be sure to use opportunities to educate patients, patrons about healthy eating and to identify healthier food choices for them. And finally, really taking the time to do some careful menu planning to ensure that, there, that there's different ways to use fresh food throughout the menu in different ways and reduce waste, and to look at charitable organizations that you can donate leftover food to. Another example um, of community action was from the small city of Camero, southeast of Edmonton. Um, and it highlights the importance of community engagement in the change process. The local public health dietitian, who was originally going to be co-presenting with us today until her parental duties took priority, has been working with the recreation department and facility concession operator for a few years to implement changes. What helped them overcome resistance and gain momentum was conducting a patron survey to capture information about current purchasing patterns, potential changes to their purchases if healthy items were introduced, opinions about which healthy food patrons would like to see, as well as ideas about what kind of a mix of food items should be available um, in terms of healthier items, less healthier items, et cetera. They, they ended up having 240 patrons respond to the survey, and this allowed them to gain more support from the city and the concession operator to move forward with contracts that include more choose most often and choose sometimes products because it demonstrated that patrons want these healthy choices. And this survey certainly can also be shared with those who are interested, and it was adapted from a patron survey on BC's Stay Active, Eat Healthy website, which is included in the resource handouts. Um, another example of action happening here in Alberta is through ARPA. We're working with three communities on projects to offer more healthy choices, um, less unhealthy choices, or promote existing healthy options and encourage their sale. So communities received $2,500, and they're receiving ongoing support from staff, opportunities to connect with each other, and to learn and share. And so um, three com these three communities are the town of Okotoks, Southland Leisure Center, and the town of Grand Cache. In the town of Okotoks, their initiative is led by the Recreation Department, and their Recreation Center is located near two, near two schools. They're also very fortunate to have a supportive 
concession operator. And so they've really taken a, a really creative and neat approach building on um, research showing that marketing healthy choices can be effective. And so they've, they've created a brand, they're using reward cards for healthy choices, and they're doing some food labeling with traffic light colored stickers. So some really creative ideas there. Um, at Southland Leisure Center, which I've talked about, they're building a new product line of healthy smoothie, smoothies. So they're using their funding to get the equipment that they need and the food products, and also doing um, some marketing and, and incentives around that. Um, interestingly, the town of Grand Cass has had more challenges. So their initiative is led by a recreation department. Um, and their recreation center is also located right in between two schools. So youth do come there and purchase food on a regular basis throughout the year. Um, unfortunately, their, their concession operator was not supportive of being involved. And so their initial proposal was to do some different initiatives, like setting up a, a separate food and vegetable stand, fruit and vegetable stand, doing some education, and offering healthy snacks in their after school programs. Unfortunately, um, our recession here in Alberta has resulted in a very high unemployment rate now in, um, in that community, and many people are leaving. And so healthy food environments are not a huge priority at the moment, um, and their, their concession operator has left. So now they're going to be using their funding to really think about and do some research into how they can create a viable healthy food service operation in the recreation facility. So I think it really just sheds light on the need to be flexible and realize the context in which um, you know, people are working. So I'm going to turn the, um, the presentation over to Ashley to talk a bit about some of the research that's been happening here in Alberta. Great. Thank you, Lisa. We've been really fortunate to have some ongoing research since 2009 that's been looking at the awareness and adoption, as well as implementation of the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth in Recreation Centers, as well as looking at the effectiveness of strategies to promote the sale of healthy food and beverages, such as nudging, as well as environmental changes. I'm going to share a few highlights from a selection of research by Dr. Dana Olstead out of the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta that's focused on these areas. In one study, a year after the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines were released, 151 uh, publicly funded recreational facilities were surveyed to help look into the, this question about whether facilities know of and use the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines. And it was discovered that only half of the facilities were aware of the guidelines, and only a handful, about one in five, were actually using them. Healthy eating was found to be a low priority, and there were few existing nutrition policies in place, as well as several barriers to adopting and implementing the guidelines. A number of these barriers included the idea that profits would be negatively impacted, as well as the perception that the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines were incompatible with an organization's mandates. That is, that some recreational facilities emphasized or identified that their operations were focusing more on generating revenue as well as on pool safety rather than the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines and improving children's eating behaviors. There is also a perception of limited control over food service. For some organizations, they felt that food service wasn't on the radar, that rather food service was contracted out, and so they didn't feel they had that sense of control over the food in their facilities, and rather that that onus should be placed upon the food service providers. Complexity was another barrier in that managers perceived that the guidelines could increase uh, how complex it was to operate their food service operations in that they believed healthier food options required additional preparation time, they were less convenient, or the products had shorter shelf lives than their traditional food offerings. Limited time and resources, as well as staffing issues, had a part to play, and as well as current cultural norms, which were highly influential on managers' intent to use the guidelines. In essence, they, some believed that People love their burgers and fries, and that's what they expect at a hockey rink. And it, would be, it was these beliefs that would guide the provision of food in their facilities. There's also the perception that it was difficult to get people to want to change, and that staff and customers were content with the status quo. So another research study looked into factors that were important or necessary to implement the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines. 
And some of these factors included the presence of key individuals to champion the guidelines within the recreational facility, as well as the recreational facility's goals and norms being consistent with the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines. Having an understanding of the guidelines, as well as some nutrition knowledge among facility managers, was also an asset, as well as the capacity, that is the time, staff, and resources to enable their adoption were important. Positive relationships between facility managers and food vendors, as well as the limitation or limited outside competition for food sales were also key factors. Other factors that were deemed as being helpful among facilities that were adopting or implementing the guidelines included a contract that was soon to be expiring by food vendors in the facility, broader support from the, the municipality or from health promoting schools and partnerships with them, as well as the adoption of choice-based policy, that is a policy which would still allow for both healthy and unhealthy food options rather than a restrictive policy focusing on healthy food options only. The next stage of research looked into moving from research to reality, that is implementing a number of different interventions and looking at ways that we can change the food environment. One intervention study in Alberta looked at healthy food availability and increasing the availability at a, a concession from 9% in the pre-intervention stage up to 25% in the intervention stage and then back to 9% in the post-intervention stage. And the findings from the study showed that the sales of healthy foods mirrored the availability of healthy food. So you can see the healthy food items made up 8% 23% during the intervention stage and 10% post-intervention in terms of sales. So importantly, they didn't find any change in the total revenues per patron in any stage of the intervention. In another study, they looked at making changes to the food environment by using nudging techniques. This included signage, so descriptive names for healthy items and placing signage at eye level taste testing healthy items, and reducing the price of different healthy items. Although they saw increases in sales amongst different categories, overall they deemed that this change wasn't significant. However, among patrons that did visit the concession during the busiest times of the day, they found that more healthy items were purchased. So in fact, three interventions combined increased the sales of healthy items by 30% for patrons that visited the facility during the busiest time. And this was maintained following the conclusion of the intervention, that is once the signage, taste testing, and price reductions were removed. So importantly, the total sales volumes, revenues, and gross profits from the healthy and unhealthy items didn't differ between the target, by period within the target concession. In another intervention, looking at menu labeling, a traffic light labeling system was introduced in a sport facility concession to highlight healthy and less healthy choices according to Alberta's nutrition guidelines for children and youth. Items that were choose least often were labeled with a red light, and those that were choose most often were labeled with a green light. About four in 10 patrons noticed that the traffic light labeling was present, and amongst those who noticed, it was well understood. And those who decided to use a traffic light label to select a menu option used the labels to select a green light item or a choose most often product. They found significant increases in the sales of green light or healthy meals and snacks, as well as a significant reduction in the sales of red light or less healthy meals and snacks. And again, in this intervention, the profit per patron didn't change between those products that were labeled. And so as a result, the authors concluded that the traffic light labeling intervention of, of the menu items was able to increase the purchasing of healthy food products. So what we can take away from this research is that there are interventions and effective strategies that can help to improve food environments in recreational facilities, and that these have had a positive result on healthy food availability, the sales of healthy foods, and without impacting or negatively impacting overall revenue. 
So from here, I'm going to turn uh, the presentation back to Lisa to talk a little bit more about a rec focus project. Okay, great. And I'm going to um, kind of whiz through this section a little bit. I am going to ask um, one of my co-presenters to help um, move my slides along because unfortunately I um, have lost access to the slides. So I will just be speaking and if someone could move us to the Rec Focus slide, that would be wonderful. Um, so really briefly, Rec Focus Healthy Food Environments module is part of ARPA's Excellence Series, which is a dynamic suite of benchmarking and analytical data services to support decision making and um, best practices in recreation and parks departments. And it was developed in response to the growing initiative, growing interest in recreation facility food environments um, and the need to assess the current situation, provide information, and support decision making and monitor progress over time. So it's a pretty comp complex, um, uh, extensive tool, and I won't discuss it at much in much at month's length at this particular point in time. But it is available on our website, and we will be doing some work this year to further develop it. Um, essentially, it was funded by the government of Alberta for about six months, from the fall of 2014 through the spring of 2015. It really gave us a chance to pilot test it. Um, it was available to any interested Alberta facility or community at no cost. And so we had a, um, a part-time project coordinator help us to um, advertise it and to support people who wanted to use the tool to assess their recreation facility food environment. So we had about 91 people register and 43 actually completed part one or part two of the tool. Uh, next slide, please. So this chart here really just depicts that most facilities have some sort of food service and many are operated, the majority are operated by private vendors. We also have found that many food services have at least some healthy options, but that there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So this, this slide here is based on Prochaska's stages of change theory. And the idea here is really just to look at where people are at in their stages of change. Here we can see that about 40% of recreation facilities have made changes. Another 40% are thinking about making changes, and there's still about 20% that aren't even thinking about it. Um, so there, are, there is work to do to, um, again, continue to move um, communities forward in doing this work. Another um, big piece here, and this if you can switch to the next slide, please. Um, fear of revenue loss is a significant barrier to changing food environments, but our work found that this is less of a problem than people believe. So 18% of respondents reported no change in their revenue, 16% um, reported, reported just some decreased revenue, and 14% reported increased revenue, but no one reported significant increases or decreases. So this is, this is not as big of a concern as people um, believe that it is. And next slide, please. So this question looked at whether policy or guidelines exist um, around healthy food environments. And basically, about a quarter of communities were planning to develop um, guidelines, but the majority have not yet started the process of developing or implementing healthy food policies or guidelines. So change is happening, but policy development is not really happening um, to support that change. And next slide, please. So this is just a quick poll um, to see where are you at in terms of making changes to improve the nutritional quality of food or beverages sold and served at your recreation facilities. So if you want to identify you know, what are the things that you've done in your community to, um, to facilitate change. And I am not able to see the poll. Um, so if Kayla, maybe if you can um, briefly summarize. Hi, uh, hi, Lisa. Sure. Um, so I'm just looking at the results now. And it looks like um, participants have um, implement, implemented a number of changes. So decreasing portion size of unhealthy items, uh, reduced promotion of unhealthy items. A lot of people have offered a greater number of healthy items uh, and promoted healthier items through things like lower prices and increased vi visibility. Um, so yeah, lots of changes across the board, which is great to see. Wonderful, great. So I'm going to turn it over to Kayla now to talk a little bit about um, another couple of projects that are happening here in Alberta. 
Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm going to um, skip to the FAIR project. But um, briefly, um, I'll just mention that um, the um, researchers at the University of Alberta have um, implemented a study called Eat, Play, Live, which is uh, aimed at evaluating the impact of the provincial nutrition guidelines um, in Alberta, as well as um, implementing a capacity building intervention. So I won't go into detail on that study, but it's taking place from November 2015 to 2017. Um, it's a pan-Canadian study, and um, we will, we're looking forward to sharing uh, results from that study as, as they emerge. So um, thanks, Lisa. And as I mentioned, uh, my, my name is Kay Latke. I'm the policy analyst for the Alberta Policy Coalition for Chronic Disease Prevention. And today I'm going to briefly uh, chat about a current project the coalition has initiated called FAIR, which stands for Food Action in Recreation Environments. And the aim of FAIR is really to use a collaborative approach to facilitate the development of healthy public policies, um, specifically in Edmonton and area rec facilities. And the focus is on healthy food and beverage policies specifically. And so um, we aim to accomplish this um, through the development of policy tools and resources, and also through stakeholder engagement. So a little bit of background on the Policy Coalition. Uh, we're a group of 18 organizations from across Alberta who work to coordinate efforts, generate evidence, and advocate for policy change to reduce chronic disease risk in Alberta. We're co-led by Dr. Kim Rain and Dr. Candace Nikofork in the School of Public Health at the U of A. So you saw that great video earlier that featured Dr. Kim Rain. Um, and our members include a, a variety of organizations from across Alberta, including Alberta Recreation and Parks Association, Dietitians of Canada, Vivo for Healthier Generations, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, and Everactive Schools, to name a few. So many of the uh, organizations that we, we discussed earlier. And I just wanted to note that for 2013 to 2016, we're a partner on the Power Up Project, which stands for Policy Opportunity Windows Enhancing Research Uptake and Practice, and that is funded through the Coalition's Linking Action for Science and Prevention Initiative. So the aim of the Coalition is really to facilitate evidence-based policies to address chronic disease risk in four areas, unhealthy eating, physical act inactivity, alcohol-related harm, and tobacco use. And we also aim to build capacity to use policy as a tool and to enhance public acceptance of policy-related activities. So every couple of years, the coalition identifies a number of strategic priorities. And one of our current strategic priorities is advocating for mandated, resourced, and monitored implementation of healthy food and beverage policies in rec facilities in Alberta. And so provincially, we work to advocate for mandated healthy food and beverage policies based on the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth. However, we also recognize that local communities play an important role in promoting policy change and facilitating learning across jurisdictions. And this is really how the FAIR project came about, um, with the hope that action at the local level can help to encourage wider policy change. So through the FAIR project, the uh, coalition is currently developing and compiling a number of tools and resources to support local policy development. And I'm going to highlight a couple of these today. So research and evidence, stories of policy change, and the policy readiness tool. And these uh, policy resources will all be accessible through our, um, our project webpage, which will be published in July. So first of all, um, through the Coalition Empower Up project, um, we, we'll be developing a number of resource and evidence sum summaries, which will provide information on key strategies for supporting policy development and addressing barriers to policy change. So this is really about highlighting some of the research that Ashley discussed earlier. Um, and these research summaries will be available through the FAIR project website. Um, what's interesting is that much of this research was conducted in Alberta. So our aim here is really to make research findings more, access more accessible to uh, local stakeholders. Uh, and then through FAIR, uh, users will also be able to access the policy readiness tool. So some um, individuals on the call might, might uh, know of the policy readiness tool already, which was developed by one of our coalition members, the PLACE Lab at the University of Alberta. 
So the policy readiness tool is a self-administered tool that helps users determine their municipality or organization's readiness for policy change using a simple self-administered checklist. And then it also provides strategies for um, facilitating policy change. So the goal here is that once users log on to our website, they can use the policy readiness tool um, along with some of the other policy uh, resources that we've developed uh, for use specifically in REC facilities. Uh, and then the last uh, resource I wanted to highlight today is um, our Stories of Policy Change uh, series. So we're in the process of developing stories of policy change happening in municipalities uh, and facilities across Alberta and Canada. Um, these stories use qualitative methods to highlight the process of policy development, challenges and facilitators, and lessons learned. So um, these stories are currently available through the Power Up uh, project website, but they'll also be accessible through FAIR. And so I know we're running short on time, so I won't go into detail um, um, on this slide, but I just wanted to mention that our first policy story focused on municipal food and beverage policy in the city of Hamilton. Uh, we've captured a number of lessons learned from this experience, um, and uh, we're in the process of developing some more policies that will go into um, that will be more specifically focused on uh, rec facilities um, in, in Alberta and other jurisdictions. Um, but um, this, the City of Hamilton experience did um, touch upon rec facilities, so um, if you're interested in that uh, policy story, definitely check out the Power Up website, www.powerupforhealth.ca, and then again it will be available through FAIR. So um, next steps for the FAIR project, we'll be launching our website in July 2016, so uh, definitely uh, stay tuned for that. And then we'll also be engaging in community and stakeholder engagement throughout the summer and then exploring opportunities to um, take lessons learned from our experience in Edmonton area um, and to see how we can share with other jurisdictions across Alberta and Canada. And if, uh, if anyone is interested in learning more about the um, FAIR project, um, Ashley Hughes is our, our great project assistant who is taking the lead on the project, so definitely give her, uh, get in touch with Ashley and her email is available on the slide. And then finally, um, we, we've um, outlined in the slides a number of tools and resources that are kind of our top picks for um, policy change and, and uh, creating healthy food environments in rec facilities. So um, the slides will be available and I think uh, Lisa has also uh, circulated a really great uh, resource handout that's available um, through Adobe Connect. So I will pass it on to Lisa if she has any kind of final closing remarks. Great, thanks so much, Kayla. Um, so that really brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, we've um, had a lot of information we wanted to share with you, so we've we've uh, rushed through a few things. We hope that this has given you a broad overview of all the great support resources that are available and a little bit of insight into how we've been moving things forward here in Alberta. So we just wanted to open it up. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, for questions, but we just wanted to open it up um, for questions. Um, and I will also just post our contact information. So if you do need to leave um, and you do have questions or you'd like information, don't hesitate to contact us. So I will just open it up and see if there are any questions. Lisa, it's Vishna. There was a, um, a couple questions throughout the presentation. Perhaps I'll, um, um, we had a question from Carolyn. I'm not sure if she's still on the line. Um, but she was, um, when you were talking about uh, what's the issue, it was some of your earlier slides. Um, there was mm -hmm. a bullet that was referring to the youth um, who were um, involved in sport. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but um, Carolyn was w wondering where the information had come from um, for that specific bullet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's know. actually... Yeah, and I have to, I'll have to go and pull it up. I don't have it um, written down here on my notes, um, but I do. It was from two studies out of the United States um, that had looked. They were interviews, and they had looked at, I think one was actually even a meta-analysis, and had looked at um, 
at kids' um, eating habits um, who were participating in sport. So I can, if you want to email me, I will send you the actual resource um, for the source for that information. Perfect. And then there was a second question that I noticed as well from Nicole. Um, when you were referring to the survey that was done in the city of Camrose, mm -hmm. um, and she was asking if, if um, those survey questions were something that you could share or... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if, I'm not sure if, we, if others want those as well. Um, we can certainly circulate them to participants or, again, if you want to contact um, one of us directly, we can make sure that you receive those, that, a copy of that um, patron survey. Perfect. And if there's any other questions at this point, we feel free to um, just type into the chat pod. Um, and uh, Lisa and Kayla and, and Ashley would be happy to answer those questions. Um, we can also, um, perhaps Chris, um, you can upload the in evaluation questions and uh, perhaps we can multitask <laughs> in our last few minutes here as well. There's a few folks that are furiously typing, so we'll let those mm -hmm. questions pop up. Sounds great. And certainly, um, I think I can speak for everyone who's on the call today um, that we are extremely impressed with the amount of research and work that has been done um, in Alberta on this topic. I think it's just fascinating. I know that there's uh, been work done you know, in other areas of the country as well, and, and certainly we um, would love to hear from others who have been you know, working furiously to really um, tackle this uh, issue um, in, in kind of recreation settings. So um, thank you, I guess, on behalf of everyone for taking on such an amazing, um, amazing task. No, absolutely. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having us and inviting us to come and share our experience here today. And absolutely, there are um, a lot of initiatives going on all across the, the country. Um, many provinces actually have developed um, you know, booklets, toolkits, um, on this topic, so I'm sure that there are resources, and again, we can direct you towards those if you're not already familiar with resources in your own province. Um, so feel free to let us know, and we can help help with that. For sure, and there is a question from Kaylee, um, and she was just wondering if you could take a couple minutes and expand on that City of Hamilton project. Um, uh, uh, Kayla, sure. I think that um, was yours. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so we do have a detailed uh, policy story on on the PowerUp website, which um, I could uh, I could circulate. Actually, I can make sure that it gets on this um, gets circulated through Adobe Connect before everyone signs off. So um, in 2011, the city of Hamilton adopted a healthy food and beverage policy, um, and it was really about demonstrating the city's commitment to healthy eating. So the uh, policy was corporate-wide and concerned all city buildings and public uh, events where food is, food is offered and where funds are used to, to procure food and beverages. So this ranges from um, the food and beverages offered at city staff functions to vending machines and co concessions in um, city recreation facilities. So um, when it came to kind of um, the city of Hamilton's experience, uh, things didn't happen o overnight. So um, in some cases, it was it was easier to implement the policy. For example, when it came to kind of city staff meetings and that kind of thing, but um, they've implemented a working group that's kind of working to implement changes in in more complex settings like rec, rec facilities over time. Um, so the the slide in the in the presentation highlights um, a number of of lessons from that experience, but the the policy story kind of goes into more detail on how how they have um, overcome challenges related to compliance and um, and trying to kind of maintain um, momentum for change over time. Oh, thanks, Lisa. That's great. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So Lisa's just put the link to the Power Up for Health website where um, the policy story is available. That's perfect. Um, thanks so much, Kayla. And um, I think what we'll do is um, there's a, um, a ton of resources, obviously, that are available and uh, about all of the work that has done has been done on this topic. And, and uh, what we can certainly do is um, in that handout area on Adobe Connect, you can see that handout 
um, the HFE um, recreation handout, as well as the slides from today's presentation are available for you to download right now before you sign off. But uh, certainly CPRA uh, would be uh, very happy to post resources on our website um, as related to this webinar as well. So we can definitely do that once the, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, webinar will be recorded and um, that will be available um, to view at a later time as well. So we will post um, any resources we can and links to these uh, websites and stories as uh, have been outlined today. So with that, um, I would like to uh, thank Lisa and Kayla and Ashley very much for their time, um, their experiences uh, and their stories um, coming out of Alberta and, and all the great work that they've done on this uh, very important topic today. And I'd like to thank all the participants who joined us for this webinar um, and for taking time um, out of your day to join us. So if should you have any further questions, again, um, feel free to contact CPRA um, or Lisa or Kayla or Ashley directly. And with that, um, I think we're going to sign off. So thank you very much, um, everyone, and uh, we wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.